All right, so welcome to lecture number six. We are continuing our discussion today uh, regarding brittle deformation. We started last time, we discussed about the brittle deformation uh, mechanisms such as friction or sliding. Um, and uh, we started discussing about something uh, called uh, failure and fracture criteria. And uh, I discussed about the Coulomb criterion. So we'll continue with these uh, aspects of rock mechanics, but we'll slightly move into geological aspects um, as well. So we'll start discussing about the, the concepts that are the ones that you are more familiar with, such as fractures. And next time we'll very slightly, we'll, we'll are discussing, we'll continue our discussion about fractures and uh, next time we'll, we'll dis start discussing about faults as well and then we'll continue with faults. But before doing this, we have to understand how these fractures are being formed. Yeah? So that's the idea of uh, criteria. Yeah? Uh, what are the criteria for materials to fail and fracture? And Coulomb did some experiment, uh, experiments and uh, if you remember, we, we saw something like uh, a straight line. So we are going to continue with this criteria. It's not only the Coulomb criteria, and I'll explain to you in a bit. And then we'll discuss about something called a reactivation and frictional sliding criterion. So that means once you have a fracture, that can be reactivated. Yeah. So sliding can occur along it, and that's what happens when things are faulted, yeah? So the idea is that once the rock has fractures, it is very likely that it, it will fail or uh, the deformation will be localized along pre-existing fractures, yeah? So we have a different criterion then. Then we'll, we'll discuss a, a bit about the effect of fluid pressure uh, on the state of stress. And then finally, we start discussing about the types of fractures. Okay, so so uh, uh, again, uh, another lecture which is mainly rock mechanics. This is experimental science. So many people have done experiments so that we can understand the behavior of rocks. Uh, as I said in a previous lecture, if you were to uh, study uh, uh, material science and become uh, engineers in material science, this would be, you know, something basic, like fundamental, you would discuss for different types of materials. And it's, it's a very uh, heavy and complex uh, part of engineering. Anyway, um, if you remember last time, these straight lines, this defined the uh, fracture criterion that we call the Navier Coulomb or Moore Coulomb, for instance. Yeah. So, if you remember, we were discussing that for certain rocks, it predicts, yeah, under what differential, differential stress, differential stress means the difference between sigma one here and sigma three here, under what differential stress, the, uh, the, the state of stress is such that, you know, you get at the uh, margin of the stability field and fractures form. And also this representation in the uh, Moore space shows us wha what angle the fracture would have. So, so basically this radius uh, with the tangent, which is a, a, a fracture criterion, gives you this angle. And this is twice the actual angle between the uh, fracture plane and sigma three. Okay. So, this Coulomb criterion for certain rocks predicts the critical state of stress needed to create a shear fracture. So a shear fracture is in this part of compressional part of the, uh, of the um, field. Now, it is not successful. So this criterion doesn't apply for the tensile part. So if we are to pull apart yeah, to uh, materials, and in our case, the rocks, this criterion doesn't work, yeah, doesn't work. We can mathematically, as you can see, we can mathematically extend the, the and we can say, well, this is 
you know, this uh, T, the tensile strength of the rock predicted by this criterion, but it's not the case. As you can see, T is shown here. So the tensile strength of the rock in general is less than the one predicted by the Coulomb criterion. And that's why it doesn't work, yeah? But it, it, it will have a different criterion that predicts this tensile strength. Um, so in general, the Coulomb criterion would work for the compression situations, yeah? And for certain types of rocks. I'll show you in a bit why. Anyway, let's talk about what happens here if we try to extend, yeah, to extend the rocks. So here we go into something that's called the Griffith fracture criterion. Now Griffith was an aeronautical engineer, but a long time ago, like a century ago. Um, and you know, uh, the aeronautical engineers, um, they are very much concerned uh, with the uh, failure of materials and especially the materials that are used uh, in building planes. Yeah? And this is a very serious matter because the metal that is used to build planes or the materials that are used to build planes, they must have a certain, uh, you know, limit in the strength of the material. And in general, the tensile strength for any material is less than the um, uh, strength un under compression. So the aeronautical engineers try to pull uh, things apart. Yeah, I have a friend uh, who lives in Canada and he's a mechanical engineer and he's an aeronautical engineer. And he, all his life, uh, professional life, that's what he did. He was doing experiments, pulling, <laughs> pulling materials for planes uh, at some point, he worked with a uh, high quality uh, bicycle manufacturer. So the idea is that the you don't want the materials to fail. And uh, the idea is uh, when they fail. So when you go and fly, you always have to know that some people from time to time go and look very carefully at the body of the plane because they look for little, for little fractures. Yeah. And, and that's very concerning, yeah? You don't want to find those. So Griffith, Griffith thought about these things. And um, theoretically, he thought, well, what is the strength of a material? So the strength of the tensile strength, if you pull it apart, basically it would be given by the, if we calculate the energy required to break the atomic bonds, yeah? Uh, so the idea is that for a rock, um, this calculation, yeah, you consider a homogeneous rock that has no defects and so on. It's about the 10th of the Young's modulus. So, so uh, this would be for, let's say for a strong rock that has uh, this uh, value of the Young's modulus, a 10th would be 10 uh, gigapascals, yeah, 10,000 megapascals. Now, when, when uh, Griffith started doing the uh, experiments, so that's why it's experimental science, he noticed that the tensile strength is something like 10 megapascals. So theoretically, it should have been 10,000 megapascals, but it's only 10 megapascals. Why? Yeah, that's why. So the response uh, is this, uh, that's what Griffith realized. He realized that materials and especially natural materials are not perfect, yeah? So we imagine uh, the rocks and the crystals as having this perfect atomic uh, structure, but they contain flaws. The flaws are like micro cracks, voids, uh, zones where, you know, the atomic uh, structure is not, it has a flaw, yeah, a defect. So these flaws, yeah, uh, basically weaken weaken the material. So because of Griffith's insight, uh, we call these flaws, we, we call them Griffith cracks, yeah, Griffith cracks, these micro fractures or uh, Griffith micro cracks, yeah. Now they can be as elliptical, yeah, 
uh, elliptical, very small fractures. Um, and, and the idea is that if this exists, then the tensile strength of the material, and in our case, the rock, is much less. Yeah, that's the idea. Um, and Griffith did experiments, and he realized that he can provide the fracture criterion for uh, the tensile situation, yeah, given by this equation, which is a parabola. And that's why, if you remember, we had this, which looked like a parabola, yeah, in the Moore diagram. So, so basically, you see the tensile strength, and this relates on uh, uh, on different planes. Um, it it basically shows, yeah, the uh, domain of stability versus the domain of instability. Yeah, that's what the Griffith criterion does in the same way that the Coulomb criterion does. So, basically, what happens microscopically with these fractures is that the stress concentrates at the tips of these microfractures or defects, yeah? And there is something very interesting. This is what this shows. If you have like a defect, which is circular, like here, here at the, at the margin, let's say if you pull like this, yeah, vertically you, you, you pull the material. And this is uh, a defect which is vertical. Here at the margin here, you have this value of the um, of the stress. Now, if this is elliptical, yeah, you see that the value of the stress at the tip here of the of the uh, defect is much larger. So what happens is the stress concentrates at the tips, and basically, the more elliptical the defect is, the larger the stress at each. Uh, at its tips, yeah? So, what you can do, what you can do, you can take a sheet of paper, yeah? Take a sheet of paper, I don't have one with me. Cut a circular hole and cut an elliptical hole and pull them and see what happens. Like the one with the elliptical hole will be much easier for you to pull it apart because this, you see, if you do this cut and if you do this cut, these are the stress concentration at the tips here, yeah? So that's the idea. Uh, this is what happens in reality. Quite an insight, <laughs> I would say. So if you have a real rocks, like here, yeah? If you have uh, real rocks, the real rocks have microfractures. And what will happen, these uh, microfractures, the, depending on the state of stress, here you pull the rock, yeah, you pull the rock. So the favorably oriented microfractures, initially this one with this one with this one, will have stress concentration at the tips here, yeah, they are fa favorably orient, uh, oriented relative to the, um, uh, to the main uh, stress. And what happens, they will basically, they will connect these defects and will create a, a big fracture yeah through the whole rock there is a propagation if you want like what happens here you see you have an active process zone and that's here you have the stress concentrated and it will open it will extend the crack here and more and more and more up to the point it unites with the next crack and so on yeah now, in the situation where you have a compressive state of stress, yeah, a compressive state of stress, you create shear fractures, yeah, shear fractures. But the situation is more or less the same. You will have defects, and these defects will basically connect, and the fracture will go through them. Yeah, that's the idea. So um, this is what happens, and you can read the te uh, text here. Now, if you have a, a situation of uh, this uniaxial compression, in general, you have this kind of um, uh, of cracks uh, that are uh, called uh, formed by longitudinal splitting, yeah, like this. Anyway, um, let's look a bit at the more diagram here. So, so far, we learned about two criteria. 
two criteria. One is the Coulomb, you see it here. And the other one is the Griffith criteria. Now the Griffith uh, works very well for the tensile part. And for certain rocks, you see it says for non-porous rocks, the Griffith structure criterion can be a reasonably realistic approximation also in the compression regime, not for all rocks. Yeah, the, uh, um, the Coulomb criterion could work for the porous rocks, for instance. So it depends on the rocks. Yeah, it depends on the rocks, but even the Griffith criterion is not a perfect criterion in the uh, compression regime as well. It predicts here the, the uniaxial compressive strength being as eight times the tensile strength. And in reality for the rocks is 10 to 50 uh, times. So uh, this criterion gives some predictions, but uh, they are more theoretical. So if we were to combine the two criteria, yeah, the, the two criteria, uh, for instance, for porous media, you could say that for the tensile part, you have the Griffith criteria. And for the compressive part, you have the Coulomb criteria. In some cases, for some rocks, it works, yeah? That's a combined criteria. Um, but in general, what people do is they take rocks, different types of rocks. Uh, yes, Gabriel. <laughs> uh, they have different types of rocks and they start doing experiments. They pull them, they compress them, they, they see when they fail, yeah? And they draw the failure envelope, yeah? They, they draw the failure envelope. It could be in some cases, it could be like the Coulomb envelope. In other cases, could be like a curved envelope, like here. So the curved envelope, experimental envelope that you get, generally is called the more failure envelope, yeah? The more failure envelope describes the critical states of stress, yeah? So if you want to become a uh, uh, rock mechanicist and do experiments, you will basically start studying various types of rocks. And you'll see what the uh, cr failure criterion is for each, each type of rock, yeah? And the same type of rock, you take it from one uh, part uh, of the continent, another from a different uh, continent, they are both marble but they, they, there might be slight differences, yeah? So that's why this is experimental science and uh, we rely on the experiments to understand when that material fails. So in general, we call the general, the general uh, fracture criterion, uh, the more criterion, yeah? Or more failure envelope. In some cases, uh, it's a failure criterion that we know about, like Coulomb, but straight line. In other cases, it's not a straight line, yeah? So here is an example. You see some people, yeah, uh, some people uh, did experiments, and this is experimental data for amphibolite, yeah, amphibolite. So this is a metamorphic rock, yeah, a metamorphic rock, which has primarily amphibole uh, and coal. Yeah, you see coal. So experimental results. And you can see uh, what the more envelope is, yeah, the basic failure criterion result that results from the experiments versus the predicted Coulomb or Griffith um, criteria. They don't work for any type of rocks. For some they work, for some not. Here, of course, they do work. The Griffith works here in the tensile part, for instance, yeah. So uh, in the case of coal. So we started from particular case, which was very simple, like a straight line, the Coulomb criteria. But we have to understand that the that nature offers us such a complexity that we generalize and we have more envelopes, yeah, more envelopes. Now, here I'm presenting you an, an even better perspective because we studied a bit of a rheology, what happens, yeah? And initially we do have brittle, uh, brittle uh, style of deformation, but then we go into the ductile style of deformation. Now the mechanism could still be brittle inside, but it, to our eyes, 
it appears as being ductile, yeah, the deformation. So the idea is you can start doing an experiment with different differential stresses, yeah, like uh, from uniaxial tension here, yeah, tension here. And then you go into the compressive part and you, you kind of increase the differential stress, but you also uh, move, basically, move the uh, center of the circle. Yeah, you increase the confining pressure, sigma three. So by doing many experiments for each type of rock, you end up with something like this. Let's say in the tensile part, you have a criterion like the Griffith criterion, uh, a parabola. And then you might have something like the Coulomb criterion, yeah, like the Coulomb criterion, or it could be a more envelope. It doesn't have to be straight line, but let's say this rock has a Coulomb criterion. And then, so here you had tensile fractures. Then you start uh, right here tensile. As you increase the differential stress here and here and here, you have a hybrid or mixed mode fra uh, fracture. And then you get, go into the compressive um, field and you have shear fractures, these ones. And then you start having ductile deformation. So the, the deformation is no longer localized for our eyes in one fracture. It seems that there is a band of deformation. Now, if we look microscopically, we will see the fractures, but we won't see them with the naked eye. So we start seeing this kind of semi-ductile, yeah, the transition from brittle um, regime to ductile regime, semi-ductile shear bands. And then you have pure uh, plastic deformation here. Uh, you don't even have fractures. Yeah. Now this part, as you can see, there is a part where it's called the phone misses criterion, which is no longer a criterion for brittle deformation. Yeah. So uh, this is an ideal evolution, but it, it shows us what happens and you can imagine that in the field we are going to see rocks that suffered yeah suffered deformation in all these stages yeah one rock shows uh, shear bands other rocks uh, shows pure um, plastic deformation other rock shows uh, just brittle deformation and so on yeah that's the idea so, so we understand now the rock mechanics and then uh, based on this when we go in the field and look at the rocks and try to understand their deformation history, then uh, we kind of understand what the conditions of stress were, because this is important. We want to reconstruct what happened with uh, our crust, with the crust of the earth at different periods in time. Yeah, that's the idea. All right. Now, the same thing, this is from the other textbook. Yeah, it's the same you see the same thing, the same stages, A, B, C, D, E here explained. Here, instead of showing, uh, uh, well, it, it, it does show Coulomb, yeah, Coulomb. Uh, it could be Coulomb or more, doesn't matter. It, it depends on the experiment. And here you can see what happens, yeah? Like as you go from tensile fracture to a transitional style to Coulomb shear fractures, brittle plastic transition and plastic yielding, yeah? So that's the idea. All right. So uh, these are failure and fracture criteria. I think that now we are finishing this part, which probably you found it kind of uh, maybe a bit challenging and boring <laughs> um, of rock mechanics. We'll still continue with a bit of it. There is a continuation to the story here. We developed fracture in a rock. Now, this rock is weakened. So let's see something that we call a reactivation and frictional sliding criterion. So the idea is we discussed about Coulomb, Griffith, Moore, yeah, until the rock failed, developed fracture, a fracture. Yeah. Now, once you have a fracture in a in a rock, yeah, once you have a fracture, that fracture will always be a plane of weakness will always be a plane of weakness you can play you can play with any material you can take um you can take um let's say uh, some plastic object yeah you can take a pen 
you can break it, yeah, or cut it, yeah, nicely, so that you 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 have a plane of weakness, and you can apply some glue, but not very good glue, yeah, some glue, so it sticks a bit, but you know that if you are gonna stress apply stress to this plane, to to this pen, yeah, or pencil, the glue will not stay very well, and at some point, if you if you do like this, maybe it won't separate, but if you apply shear stress, yeah, it will separate, yeah? So it's a plane of weakness. That's the problem. That's why we don't want things to break. Uh, the same thing happens in rocks, yeah? So uh, you have a plane of weakness and think about the history, the history, geologic history, yeah? A volume of rock developed fractures. Those are planes of weakness. And in future, you have a certain stress configuration. And if this plane is favorably oriented, it may respond to that stress configuration and sliding might occur along that plane and you'd have faults, yeah? That's the idea. So what nature will do, instead of creating new fractures, because to create a new fracture, you need more energy, whereas to slide on a pre-existing fracture, it's less energy. So this will be the path taken by nature. Yeah, that's how things are in uh, the physical world. So here, basically, again, we go, come back to the more diagram. So bear it with me. When we have an intact rock, just with small defects, yeah, the Griffith micro cracks, then the idea is that you have, you see, the more Coulomb criterion could be just a more criterion, like a curved, could be straight line, doesn't matter. You have to see where and on what plane, yeah, and typically you have a plane which is like at uh, six degrees, um, it will fail. Now, once you have that plane and other planes, fractures in the rock, then all you have to do is to have a plane which obviously should be favorably oriented so that sliding will occur. So the criterion for frictional sliding, you see, puts a lower bar than the uh, more criterion, yeah? So basically, if you have a pre-existing fracture oriented at this angle, let's say 60 degrees uh, relative to sigma three, yeah, if, if that exists, the rock will slide along that fracture. It will not develop a fracture, yeah? This is what will happen. So this is a criterion for frictional sliding, yeah? And the criterion, basically, what, what mathematically shows here, um, we talk about the coefficient of sliding friction. Now, in physics, in high school physics, and now in uh, the university physics courses, you did mechanics and you played with inclined planes and with bodies on inclined planes and about, you know, the friction. Now, this is what happens. We have basically a coefficient of sliding friction, yeah? Depending on how big it is, yeah, this coefficient, it tells us, yeah, uh, how to slide along that surface or not, yeah? So, you can imagine a fracture will have this coefficient. Now, if let's say some minerals grew in there, so the fracture sticks a bit, yeah, sticks a bit, you might have some cohesion, yeah? So instead of this line going through zero here, it would go through somewhere here, so you would have some co cohesive strength, yeah? And basically the criterion would be basically expressed mathematically by this relationship, yeah? But mathematically, you see, it's kind of very simple. Uh, this criteria. Now, people like Byerly did experiments. They took, some people take intact fresh rocks, other people take rocks that have fractures in them, and they do experiments, because again, it's experimental science. And that's why we have the Byerly's law, yeah, uh, of uh, friction, uh, that gives us a frictional sliding criterion, yeah. And as uh, Gabriel pointed out again, um, when we talked uh, at you know the slide uh, the fracturing criterion as being 
made of different pieces. Here, what Barley saw was that for sigma n less than 200 megapascal, you have uh, the uh, relationship of a certain line, you see that goes through zero. And for, uh, for sigma n's larger than 200 megapascals, you have a different uh, friction sliding criterion, for instance, yeah? So this is to give you an idea that some people developed their careers along, you know, these ideas of discovering uh, these properties of the rocks. And we know them for, you know, major types of rocks and so on. So now we can understand under what conditions a certain volume of rock will, uh, will move, yeah, will slide and you'll have a longer fold zone, yeah, for instance. All right, so this is Byerly's law for which is a friction sliding criteria. Now, we are done, finally, we are done with this part of rock mechanics. I have to add one more thing, which is important. I'll explain to you why it is important. Now you, you understand the importance of why we need to, to understand why the volumes of rocks under what conditions they fracture and then they uh, folds form and so on. Now, there is one thing in nature. This is fluid pressure, yeah, fluid pressure. So as you know, or if you don't know, you'll learn now. There are many rocks that are porous and permeable, especially in the oil industry, this is very important, yeah? So this pore space is filled with fluids. Now we represent the fluids as water, but the water contains dissolved material, yeah? So dissolved uh, uh, minerals, yeah? So it's not just pure water that we drink from the tap, uh, not in all cases. And what happens, sometimes you can have gas. In other cases, you can have oil in the pore space, for instance. But in general, we have water, yeah? The, the, and the qu question is, what's the pressure? What's the pressure uh, of the water in the pores, yeah? So if you have hydrostatic pressure, that means uh, the pressure of the water in a pore is actually the pressure of the column of water if this pores connect, yeah, so the rock is permeable and they can, co they connect. So all the water is connected from the surface to a certain depth, then it's hydrostatic pressure. But this is not the case. We don't, we don't have connection to all the depths. So at some point you have uh, formations that have water in the pores, but this water, the pressure of the water is not given by the hydrostatic column. Yeah? It's, it's much more than what would be the hydrostatic column. So the, that's overpressure, yeah? And the, the overpressure is very important in oil exploration because you have seen movies, movies, uh, typically American movies with the Wild West when they colonized the West and found oil and so on. And you'd see in the movies, how they would encounter the oil and uh, you, you, you'd see an artesian fountain of oil or whatever, of water and so on. So imagine you don't want to, when you drill, you don't want to be unprepared when you enter a formation that is over pressured, yeah? Because it would blow <laughs> your rig up and many other bad things like, uh, what was it, 10 years ago, the uh, BP, um, the BP drill hole in the Gulf of Mexico. That's what happened with it. Yeah, it, it went into an, uh, a region of overpressure. They weren't prepared for it and uh, that led to a disaster, environmental disaster. Uh, so if you will become an oil geologist, this will be of very much concern to you. Now, what happens with the fluid pressure? The fluid pressure, you can imagine the pressure of the fluid will push against the wall of the pore, yeah? So we'll push. So on the one hand, you have the, the uh, basically stresses, the geologic stresses, as we discussed, yeah? You have the geologic stresses, yeah, that act on the rock. Uh, yeah, the deep water horizon, that was the name of the, of the hole, sure. Yeah, yeah. So on one hand, you have the geologic stresses that act 
on the grains yeah, and on the rock. And on the other hand, the pore pressure will act oppositely to the geologic stresses. Yeah? So that's why the fluid pressure counteracts the normal stress. Yeah? So what happens is that when we look at the more circle and we have the sigma one, sigma three, if you have fluid and the pressure of the fluid will actually, will actually decrease actually the normal stresses. Yeah, it will counteract them. So it is as if you move to the left, the more circle, because you have an effective stress. The effective stress is the resultant stress. Yeah, actually, let's say you have the normal stress here, for geologic normal stress like this, but the water will push it a bit. Yeah, will push it a bit in the opposite direction. So the resultant is an effective stress, which is this one. Yeah. So if you had the principal stresses like this, the effective principal stresses would be like this. Yeah. So that that's the idea. Uh, so if we were to look at the um, let's say Coulomb fracture criterion, if you have fluid and the fluid has a certain pressure, actually the Coulomb fracture criteria, the equation for this would be like this. Yeah. With the effective stress. So imagine if you didn't have the fluid, you'd be in a state of stress like this. Once you have the fluid in the rock, due to its pressure, it will translate the state of stress here. So now you learn something which is extremely important in geotechnical engineering, for instance, and in oil engineering, that once you do this, you might reach the critical state of stress and the rock can fail. Yeah. Now, here is a thing. It can fail, as you can see, the, depending on the differential stress, it can fail through shear fractures or it can fail through tensile fractures if it's a small differential stress due to the fluid pressure. Now, let's think about practical things. We discussed about the oil industry, yeah? And there is so much discussion now about fracking. Now, fracking <laughs> is a technique to uh, liberate some hydrocarbons from the, um, from the oil shales, yeah? Uh, the, the hydrocarbons are in the rock and the rock is not permeable, so they don't flow. So you drill here, and it's not like a sandstone that is permeable and the oil would flow in the drill hole. In the uh, oil shale, it's not permeable. So what people do, they have to fracture this formation so that the oil will start seeping and going through the fractures into the oil. So what they do, this process of fracking, so controversial, uh, there is discussion about it in Colombia, in the United States, in Europe, and so on because the environmentalists say, well, this is bad. We don't want this. Uh, the oil industry says, well, how else can we get the oil? Yeah. So what they do, they drill two holes. And in one hole, they pump fluid with big pressure, Yeah, pressurized fluid. So what will happen once this fluid gets to the rock? Yeah, It will hydrofracture it because it will change its state of stress. So fractures will be created in the rock. Once they create the fractures in the rock by pumping water into the rock here, then the oil is pushed and flows into the other well, yeah? Exactly, David, exactly. They make the rock permeable because the rock is not permeable, yes. But this is the application of the principle that physical principle that is basically shown here in these more diagrams yeah they fracture basically the rock by increasing <laughs> the fluid pressure in the rock yeah so that's the idea another example here there are pr problems with uh landslides these leaciamentos or something like this in espanol um you go to villa vicencio and the road has problems yeah with with this landslides. So the instability, think about when it rains a lot, 
the water infiltrates and so on. The, the fluid pressure in the formation yeah, increases. So the state of stress change, changes and the volume of rock, if it has, let's say a, a weak plane, a, a pre-existing fracture, that weak plane, you have the, it reaches to the uh, sliding uh, criterion region, yeah? And the whole volume of rock slides, yeah? As a result of a lot of rain, yeah? So that's why you have continuous problems with this. So as you can see, this is something we have to understand the mechanics because we as a human society need to address these problems. I want to practically solve uh, problems like oil extraction or to know which zones are at risk of landslides. Yeah. So, for instance, okay. So, uh, this is the effect of fluid pressure and the effective stress, the actual stress that the uh, the rock feels. Yeah. Now, we are done with this part of rock mechanics for the time being. Um, a bit, a few more slides uh, on the fractures. Yeah, we start discussing about fractures now from a geologic perspective. Yeah, from a geologic perspective. So um, we discussed that brittle deformation. Yeah, brittle deformation uh, is basically this type of localized deformation in a volume of rock. Yeah, as a result of the uh, formation of fractures. Yeah. Um, so the fracture itself is a surface of discontinuity in the material. So initially it was continuous, yeah, and suddenly you have this discontinuity. So you see here some types of fractures, and this one uh, is called shear fracture or slip surface. And this term, uh, well, as you can see, there is there is movement, yeah there is movement which is parallel to the fracture, yeah, to the fracture plane. And this movement, if it's uh, small, if the displacement is small, when we talk about centimeters, millimeters, things like this, we call them shear fractures or slip surface, yeah, shear fractures. Now, if it's on the order of meters, we talk about folds, yeah, but when it's small, shear fractures. So this is one type of fracture, yeah? Now, you have here something, this and here. These are called extension fractures. Now, extension, as opposed to the shear fracture, the movement is perpendicular, perpendicular to the plane of discontinuity, as you can see. So, um, and here we have uh, some terminology. Let's, let's talk about the terminology. What you see here, yeah, this fracture is called the joint. Now, the joint, the displacement, yeah, is very small or almost no displacement perpendicular to the uh, fracture plane, uh, very small. Then you call it joint, yeah. Now, if, uh, if you have, let's say, um, some centimeters, yeah, uh, centimeters, um, and they are filled with gas, let's say with air, for instance, um, then we call them fissures. Now, you may ask me, one, what's the boundary between a joint and a fissure? And there is no exactly defined boundary, yeah? It's a bit kind of subjective. Uh, you, with experience, you would call something a fissure or a joint, yeah? Uh, there is no real, but the ones that are kind of wider, we can call them fissures, yeah? Uh, now, what happens if you fill this fissure with um, minerals, so let's say fluids circulated through the fissure and uh, they precipitated minerals. And in general, these minerals can be calcite, which is calcium carbonate or quartz, yeah? Quartz. So you, then you call this veins, yeah? So these uh, fractures that are filled with these minerals, they are called veins, okay? So when you, when you see uh, you, in many rocks, you'll see veins of quartz or veins of calcite, for instance, yeah? Now, if the fissure is filled with 
magma that solidified, they are called dikes, dikes in English. I think it's dikers in, in Espanol, I think, but dikes in English. Yeah, so um, you, ha you have here the explanation, fissure, veins, and dikes. This is the terminology, yeah? Now, let's look at some images because we cannot go in the field. We, we have a look at a couple of images. This is an image from Sweden. So uh, in the Baltic Shield, um, so it's old terrain, yeah, Precambrian in age, you see from the Proterozoic. Um, and what you see here is a big outcrop, you see a big outcrop uh, of an igneous intrusion, yeah. I don't know exactly what igneous intrusion it is, but you see it's kind of a, a mafic intrusion here. Now, here are two geological observations that you can make. One is that you have this white material, yeah, uh, and then this uh, dark material here, yeah. So this white material, yeah, uh, it's basically felsic magma that crystallized, yeah, and we call this a pegmatite dike. So this is a dike, this was magma, and pegmatite is a um, a type of granitic rock, yeah, like granite, granitic rock, but the crystals are quite big, quite large, and that's pegmatite, yeah. But the composition, uh, in general, you'd have quartz and feldspar, and the pegmatite felsic, um, uh, felsic um, material there can contain some rare minerals, yeah, rare, rare minerals like spodumen, uh, which is of um, um, mineral of lithium, uh, for instance, beryl, uh, a mineral of beryllium, yeah, uh, for instance, and other rare metals like tantalum, for instance. So uh, pegmatite dikes can be uh, places of, of interest for some rare metals. Now, here, the other dike that you see here, you see, this was mafic magma, yeah? And it's called a dolerite dike. So it is a type of basalt, yeah, the dolerite. So you see, felsic magma, mafic magma. The two fissures are called dikes, yeah? Now, the other geological observation that you can make here, because as I said, we cannot have a Salida del Campo to discuss on outcrops things, so we discuss them on images like this. Um, yes, of course, it can take uh, a fracture, it can take place parallel to, to layers, of course. It depends on the state of stress, but the, the layers can be, and the interfaces can be planes of weakness as well. But here is a massive, you see a massive intrusion here. So it got this, this fissure that was filled with magma. Now look at the time, because this is very important for us as geologists. So if, you, if someone asks you, can you give me the time order of the geological events that you see here? And you will say, sure. First of all, what's the emplacement of this intrusive body? Then it was fissured, yeah? So it, it was fractured, if you want, and the a fissure was formed here. And along this feature came this felsic magma, it crystallized. And later on, after this crystallized, the, the rock was fractured again, and the new fracture was formed here, along which, along which this mafic magma came, yeah, and crystallized. So uh, this is rock number one, then later rock number two, then later rock number three. So here you can reconstruct a history, yeah? The other observation here, if you want, you can see here our fractures. Look at this one. This is obviously a fissure. Now it is filled with air. You can see it here. But you can see our fractures here like this one these ones, I would call these joints, yeah, these are joints, yeah, you see joints here. And next time we'll see that we can have joint sets, like parallel joints in certain directions, yeah, 
fields of parallel joints. So here, obviously, you have one which is like this, this, this big joint became a fissure, and here you can see them here. But then you have other joints yeah, like this, cross-cutting, another, another set of joints like this. And these type of intrusions can have joints like this. They can have even joints parallel to the surface you see here, like here probably there is a joint, yeah? And part of the material here was removed, for instance. So in 3D, you can have joints in perpendicular directions, but also like this, yeah? So you can have three sets of joints, for instance, that go through a volume of rock. All right, so this is one example. I'm gonna show you another example. Uh, this comes from Spain, uh, from Catalonia, uh, from Costa Brava. So you see here, what you see here, um, you see a lamp profile, here is lamp of Vido, uh, dike, yeah? So uh, this is mafic, a mafic rock. You can see basically uh, what happened here. You had this, this dike, yeah? Uh, basically coming along this big fracture. But if you look closely at the host rock, yeah? At the host rock here, which looks like a granitic rock, it, I, you can see here different joints, the classes, yeah? Uh, you can see these are joints here, and these are joints here, now these ones, but also you see the joints that are horizontal here, yeah, like this. So the material from here disappeared, yeah, the continuation of this, but here is another joint and so on. So these are basically uh, decompression, yeah, decompression uh, joints that you, uh, this uh, granite body um, suffered. We'll talk about this process of decompression um, in the next class, yeah. But I wanted you to, to get a geologic feel, like I tortured you a lot with, <laughs> with the Moore circle and with the uh, rock mechanics. Now let's look at the rocks a bit, yeah, that's the idea. But when you look at the rocks, like an uninformed person, yeah, a person who has no idea about rock mechanics, about the geology, they come here, take a picture, and they say, oh, how nice it is. But they don't understand much from, you know, the details of this rock. Now you know more, yeah? You are, you are able to, to tell a history and you are able to kind of understand this volume of rock. Yeah, that's the idea. That's why, what we develop, our skills here. All right, so here, when we look at the types of fractures, yeah? you can see the principal directions of stress applied to a volume of rock. And we can have these, um, these fractures that open perpendicular to sigma three, so sigma three, yeah, these ones. And you can have, you can have these oblique fractures. You see them oblique, uh, that are shear fractures, yeah, shear fractures. Now, what is interesting is that these shear fractures, as you can see, they develop at uh, 20 to 30 degrees relative to sigma one. That means more or less 60 to 70 degrees relative to sigma three, yeah? Uh, and they, they form in conjugate pairs, yeah? Conjugate pairs. And uh, we'll see examples of conjugate pairs of shear fractures, all right? So that's the idea. Uh, with fracturing uh, volumes of rocks. Now, finally, uh, just they said we are done. Uh, finally, in 3D, how should we imagine a fracture? Because the fracture will not go infinitely, yeah? It must end somewhere. <laughs> so what happens? How does it end, yeah? Now, when we look at the surface, we are here at the surface and we walk the ground, yeah? And we see here uh, a fracture, yeah? Basically, the fracture is a plane yeah, or a surface of discontinuity in the rock. But what we see here, it's actually what we call the fracture trace, yeah? So it's the intersection of the plane of discontinuity with the uh, surface of the earth. So this intersection, we call it fracture trace, 
Yeah, and uh, this uh, basically um, point where the fracture terminates is called the fractured tip. Yeah. Now, if you were to go inside, if you could go inside the volume of rock, yeah, this fracture will terminate along something that is called the fracture front. Yeah, the fracture front. Uh, that's the idea. And depending on the rock, depending on the rock, yeah, um, some fractures have irregular surfaces. Others are kind of smoother, like in a plane. And here is a coin-shaped fracture. Here is a blade-shaped uh, fracture. Uh, here is a bedding plane, you see, and this is perpendicular to the bedding plane, for instance. Everything very much depends on the state of stress and the pre-existing pre -existing situations in the rock, pre-existing planes of weaknesses and so on. All right, so I'm trying to uh, find a way to, to bring your understanding uh, of the complexity of the geological reality. And that's why we have to understand a bit of rock mechanics so that we can picture what happened with these volumes of rocks. All right, so this is for today. Uh, we will continue our discussion of fractures next time, which is on Tuesday, on Thursday, sorry, whoever's. Uh, I'm giving you required reading, yeah, uh, some sections in these books uh, that explain to you what we discussed and this fracture uh, and uh, frictional sliding criteria. Um, and this is it. If you have questions related to today's class, please ask me. If you uh, don't, uh, have a you know, a great afternoon. I'll see you on Thursday. And for those of you who want to discuss about, you know, the questions in the test, like Gabriel and maybe David, uh, you are welcome to stay, yeah? So it's up to you. So first, any questions related to today's class? Well, if not, that's fine, don't worry. You can ask them later. Okay, then. Uh, let me just open my, um, here I, I have to um, open my file management program here so that I can find uh, the test here. Let me find it. Okay. Uh, teacher, I already found the presentation that you talk about, some of the questions that I have. The, uh, incognita and answer, so I think I'm all right as, as well. All right, okay, David. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so those of you who don't want to stay, you are, <laughs> you can go. So thank you, thank you for uh, for being here with me. Uh, those of you who want to stay, you are more than welcome. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, okay, David. Uh, ciao, Maria. <laughs> Um, you're just okay. Thank you. See you, Juan Daniel. Uh, so Gabriel, um, Gabriel, please, if you, uh, if you want to uh, tell me what you'd like to talk about, and okay. we go. To... I I would like to understand the the question asked yeah. in the test. Yeah, let's uh, let me uh, share with you the uh, test here. I hope you can see it. Um, <clears throat> all right. I, I actually, no, I will leave the grabation because maybe someone else wants to watch later. Okay, Gabriel. So uh, in the second part? Yes. Okay, let's go to the second part. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, first part. Last okay. uh, choice questions. This one? Um, Question number The one. former ones, upper? Yes. Uh, all In right. the case of the lithostatic state of stress. All right. The differential stress is... Uh, yeah. yeah. So, okay. 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 So, um, if you look in the, uh, in the lecture notes or in the textbooks, when we define the term lithostatic, yeah, I said lithostatic, 
is equivalent, similar to hydrostatic, but hydrostatic we use for fluids, yeah? Uh, lithostatic we use for rocks. So lithostatic means that uh, sigma one and sigma two and sigma three are equal, yeah? So it's a state of stress where basically you don't have differential stress, yeah? So you don't have a certain direction along which the, the stress is larger than in the other directions. It's like in a fluid, yeah? You, when you submerge yourself in water, yeah? The water pushes, uh, let's say you are very small, like a little, little ball, very small. The water will push from all directions, yeah? With the same uh, pressure. Like the which submarines. Is the equivalent of, hmm? Like the submarines. Um, I don't know how to say it. Um, no, but what I mean to say, we talk about the state of stress at the point. All directions, you know? all directions. Yeah. All are... directions are, it's equal, the pressure. You talk about the pressure of water, yeah? It's the same in all directions. In the case of the lithostatic state of stress, the actual stress in all directions is the same, yeah? So it's not, you don't have a certain direction where you have a larger stress. So then you don't okay. have then you don't have differential stress. It's just a matter of definition, yeah? That of the term lithostatic. We need to have a word to define this state of stress because it yes. exists, this state of stress, yeah. So that's the idea. It's similar to hydrostatic and aerostatic stress, for example. It's for absolutely plate. similar to hydrostatic, but we use the word lithostatic, yeah. <laughs> In the rock, okay, and then you don't have you don't have differential stress. That's the idea. But the differential stress is applied for a measure to a point of the of, of to one point. Yes. So the idea is that uh, at a point, yeah, you can you can have different uh, the the stress as we discussed. You can have a stress ellipsoid. Yeah. So, yes. So and this stress ellipsoid has three principal directions, yeah? So what happens is um, these principal directions, yeah? Um, if they are not, uh, they, if they are equal, like a sphere, then the stress ellipsoid the, the, uh, becomes a sphere. If it's an ellipsoid, then you have different uh, lengths of this axis of the ellipsoid, yeah? Which would be sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. So, Differential stress is like sigma one minus sigma three, yeah. Sigma one minus sigma two, depending in uh, in which plane you consider the the situation, yeah. So differential stress means that you have a difference in stresses between different directions, yeah. That's the idea. Mm, okay. Yeah, I remember that you probably ans didn't answer B here, answered something else, uh, maybe C. C or A. I can't remember which one. Yes. But I yes. remember that I noticed that one and I I, uh, I thought that you didn't pay uh, attention to the definition. <laughs> yeah. Thank All you, right. teacher. Okay, you are welcome. Uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, let me stop this so that I can see. It's only me and you, so <laughs> everyone left. So I can stop the gravation here. Um.